In the full moon in July, we commemorate the Buddha's first sermon, setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. Because at the conclusion of that sermon, not only was this the Buddha's first teaching, but as one of the members of his audience gained the Dharma eye, became the first member of the Noble Sangha. The texts tell us that in the days following, the Buddha taught more Dhamma to um, the rest of the five brethren, so that ultimately all five of them had attained the Dharma eye. Then he gave a second sermon, at least the second one recorded. We don't know what he taught the others in the meantime. But the second sermon focuses on the topic of not-self. It was because of this sermon that all five of them became arahants. So the awakening was not partial anymore, it was full. So we're not sure exactly what day or how many days after the full moon he gave this talk. So we can, come, we can commemorate it tonight. It was about this time of the year that he gave it. And it's good to reflect on it. Unlike his talks where he usually starts with a question, here he starts with a statement. Form is not self. Makes the same statement about the rest of the five aggregates, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness. And you might wonder why he brings up the topic of not self. After all, all five of the brethren had attained the Dharma eye. And one of the consequences of that is that you let go of identity views, where you define your, yourself either as an aggregate or as the owner of the aggregate, or as in the aggregate, or as the aggregate in you. And that there's some, still some unfinished business around the topic of not-self. Sometimes you hear it said that stream entry is when you see that there is no self, but the fact that the Buddha had to give this talk to the Five Brethren shows that that's not true. And the reason comes in another sutta where there's a non-returner, his name is Venerable Kamaka, explains what it's like to have abandoned identity views, but not to yet have abandoned conceit. He says even though you don't identify with any of the five aggregates, still there's a lingering sense of I am around the five aggregates. The image he gives is of washing some clothes. And then the, even though the dirt is out, there's still the smell of the detergent. You put the clothes away in a hamper, and eventually the smell of the detergent goes away. In the meantime, it's still lingering around the cloth. In the same way, there's still a sense of I am lingering on the five aggregates. So that's what the Buddha had to get the, his listeners to let go of. He starts by saying with each aggregate, if this really were yourself, then it wouldn't lead to disease. You'd be able to say with regard to each aggregate, let it be this way, let it not be that way. And to some extent you can control the aggregates, but there's a lot that you cannot. You know, when the body gets sick, it doesn't ask permission. When your feelings turn from pleasure to pain, they don't ask permission. When your perceptions and your thoughts turn on you, even your consciousness of good things passes away. So the first argument is that these things don't lie under your control. And then he starts his questionnaire, and this is a questionnaire that he gives again many, many times. The argument about control shows up only a few more times in the canon. There's one great passage where a professional debater is coming to debate the Buddha on the question of the five aggregates being self or not, to death after. And so the Buddha points out. Kings control their property. Kings control their kingdoms. The professional debater, of course, goes along with him on that one because he wants to appeal to the kings. And they can say, this should be done, that shouldn't be done. But how about your new body? Can you say it shouldn't grow old, that it shouldn't get sick, it shouldn't die? And the debater knows he's been beat already. 
That's one case where the Buddha does again use the argument on control. But it's pretty rare. Much more common is the questionnaire that he again then gives to the, the five brethren. That gets repeated many, many times throughout the canon. In the case of each aggregate, is it constant or inconstant? It's inconstant. That which is inconstant, is it easeful or stressful? Well, it's stressful. And then he says, is it appropriate to claim that anything that is inconstant and stressful, this is me, this is myself, this is what I am? Now notice he's not getting the five brethren to come to the conclusion that there is no self, simply that each of the aggregates is not worthy of calling self. It's inappropriate. The question of whether there is or is not a self, that gets put off to the side. Just focus on the aggregate. Now why is it important to focus on the aggregates? Because the Buddha had already identified the aggregates, and when you cling to them as suffering. And one of the ways in which you cling, of course, is through your sense of self. In fact, all the other forms of clinging can be directly related to a sense of self. So in line with the Four Noble Truths, which, were, which was the main topic of the first talk, he wants them to see that these are not worth clinging to, they're not worth craving. And then he goes on to say, any instance of the aggregates. In the beginning he's having the focus on the aggregates in the present, but then he says, any instance of them, past, present, or future, near or far, refined or coarse. All of them should not be seen as myself. This is an interesting move, and very few people have noticed what he's done. He st starts out by focusing on the present moment, and then he has them extend their mind everywhere they can think of. Past, present, future, any place in space, near or far. The point being that you might say, well, what I'm holding on to right here is not good, but maybe there's something else out there that I could hold on to someday. He's asking them to reflect that. Everything out there is just the same kind of aggregates. There's even a passage elsewhere where he says that when you re recollect your past lives, that's all it is, is aggregates. The recollection itself is aggregates, and the things you're recollecting are aggregates, and they're all passing away, passing away. You can't go back and latch onto them. And no matter what you would gain in the future, it would be the same sort of thing. You can't really legitimately latch onto it. It's in this point of the reflection that it really becomes overwhelming. There's no place to hang on. And it depends on the listener. If they're still willing to let go, let go, let go of everything that they can cast their mind to. See, that it's not worth clinging to, not worth even craving to begin with. That's how there's an awakening to another dimension. As long as you're holding on to anything, even your concept of that further dimension, which is what's what you experienced in stream entry, when the, seeing the Dharma or gaining the Dharma, even that you have to let go of. So when there's no place for the mind to focus its desires. This is what undercuts craving, because, as the Buddha said in the definition of craving, it latches on here, latches on there, focuses here, focuses there. It always has a place, always has a location. And the purpose of this questionnaire is to deprive the mind of any possible location to focus craving. And when you let go all around, the Buddha says, then you're released everywhere. An interesting concept. The mind is usually focused someplace. It has a location. If not a physical location, then there's a mental location. But you're trying to deprive it of any kind of location at all. This is how they became awakened. Now, over the years, the Buddha gave the same questionnaire to others. In some cases, people would listen to it and say, gee, that's interesting. Other people would listen to it to gain the Dharma. Others would listen to it and they gain full awakening. Depending on how thorough their letting go was. 
the willingness to cast their minds not only on the present moment, but also in all directions in space and time, and see there's no place to go. That's when they're willing to let go of all idea of place. So as at the conclusion of the, the talk, I said it was through non-clinging that they gained release. Again, it's not a question of coming to the conclusion there is no self. It's simply not clinging to anything. That's the logic of the not-self teaching. It deprives you of places to cling. And it does that because, in terms of the Four Noble Truths, the clinging is suffering. You cling because of your craving. When you can undo the craving, then there's release. And that release is unassailable. So it's in the light of the Third Noble Truth that this questionnaire makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, it's just cutting the knees out from under you and giving you nowhere to go. Well, the Buddha is saying if you learn how not to want to go anywhere, present or past or future, near or far, that's when something really good opens up. So it's good to commemorate that event, because it reminds us that the Buddhist teachings are effective. You practice in line with them, and they can promise something really good. Other people have benefited, and we have every right to benefit from them as well. Just a question of what you're going to continue to hold on to. As long as the path hasn't been completed, you hold on to that. But you've got to learn how to let go of everything except the path first. And then you can focus on your attachment to the path. And when you can let that go, then your letting go is all around. You're released everywhere. So look at your attachments right now. Which ones are really worth holding on to in the light of what can happen when you can let go? Which is why, even though there's no formal holiday associated with this event, it's a good one to keep in mind every year. And of course, to keep in mind every day as you keep on practicing. <laughs>